It survived countless perils and perils beyond count. First, it was hungry mowers, then the settlers with their saw-toothed saws. But after 20 million years, Cody faced their biggest peril yet. Dog walkers, Instagram selfies, and Cody dieback. It's a disease without a cure. It's neither fungi, algae, nor bacteria, yet displays attributes of all three, producing soil-borne spores that seek out the Cody root system, cut off the water supply, and kill the tree. It can be spread by but a pinhead of soil. This includes possums and wild pigs. However, the main vector is humans, walking, tramping. From 2008 to 2016, it took only eight years for 20% of Cody in the Waitakere Ranges to be infected with the disease. Keep that rate going, and they could be extinct by 2048. But this new threat is not new at all. Cody dieback belongs to a mysterious family of plant diseases called Phytophthora, and this family has always had a long and troubling past. Phytophthora cinnamomi kills Australia's beloved Jarrah tree, Phytophthora megacaria causes the largest cocoa crop losses in Africa, and it was Phytophthora infestans that caused the Irish potato famine of the 1840s. Likewise, our own Phytophthora remains a mystery. The closest we've come to a cure is with the chemical phosphite, which can be injected into individual trees to enhance your immune response. However, this is only life support. Once it's turned off, the tree faces reinfection. So instead, it's a matter of the who, what, why, when, and where the disease is spreading. If we can contain it, we can stop it, making our best weapon, rahui and track closures. But there are two problems, monitoring and knowing. First, monitoring. The sooner dieback is confirmed, the sooner we can inject phosphite, and the sooner we can curb the spread by getting people out. The current test is baiting, which involves flooding a soil sample with water and floating the roots of lupin flowers on top. Compounds in these roots are magnets for cotodieback spores, and once smothered, they can be incubated on nutrient-rich agar plants, allowing us to grow cotodieback and identify it with a microscope. Genetic tests are less commonly used, yet promising, detecting dieback with astonishing accuracy. However, both these methods are lab-based, require expensive equipment, and take up to two weeks to complete. Remember, dieback moves as fast as people move, so two weeks suddenly becomes an eternity. Our second issue is knowing. We don't know if Cody dieback was introduced to New Zealand or if it's been here all along. Having this knowledge would guide efforts in research, containment, and perhaps a cure. What we need is a rapid, reliable test. What we require is widespread community testing. What I propose is a pregnancy test for Cody, or more specifically, a lateral flow device, a test strip used in a variety of areas, including pregnancy, virus, and plant disease tests. The idea isn't new. It's been adapted to Cody Dieback's closest cousin, Phytophthora cinnamomi, all the way back in 1994 by Australian professor Adrian Harnham. It's also been adapted to a generic test for all Phytophthora diseases. This can be bought online, but with a multitude of similar, introduced yet harmless Phytophthoras often found near Cody, there's plenty of room for error. It's over three years since I discovered this research and realised the idea hadn't, and still hasn't, been applied to Cody. It seems that while we've been searching for a cure, we missed a clever little piece of tech that's been right under our noses this whole time. Since then, I've been developing and adapting a method for a new Cody dieback test. So how does it work? It's all down to the humble antibody, the same little Y-shaped protein that binds to the surfaces of viruses and bacteria to destroy them. The same protein produced by your body to fight a cold. To begin, soil or a small piece of root, root tissue is broken up and watered down. This sample is placed on one end of the test strip, and as it flows through the paper, it faces a series of hurdles. The first hurdle is antibodies attached to fluorescent particles, which bind to the coated dieback cells as they flow through. The second is a line of stationary antibodies stuck to the test paper. 
as more and more codidivac cells bind to these stationary antibodies, the fluorescent particles form a visible colored line, confirming a positive result in five minutes. But to have a test, we need antibodies, and to have antibodies, we need to generate them. So I contacted Professor Hartham from Australia to see how this could be achieved for Cody. She said the outline of the basic methodology for producing and screening the monoclonal antibodies is in keeping with the methods I have used and published in the past. In other words, the process remains the same no matter the context, and it's all due to the immune system of a mouse. Scientists describe it as naive because it generates antibodies to any bug, bacterium or virus even if the mouse is unaffected. That includes plant diseases. When dieback cells are introduced to the mouse, the spleen scrambles antibodies to fight this perceived threat. These antibodies are manufactured specifically for Cody dieback, kind of like how only one key fits a lock. So when spleen cells are removed and fused with cancerous cells, they create hybridomas, a unique mashup that churns out antibodies due to the spleen cell component while constantly replicating and repeating due to the cancer component. Under the right conditions, antibodies are produced virtually without limit. Now the important part to consider is enlarged on the right. Here, antibodies are screened against similar phytophoras to ensure there's no cross-reactivity. As part of producing antibodies, this needs to be done anyway. But at the same time, we learn a little bit more about Cody dieback. If some antibodies bind to the similar phytophoras, it infers a likeness in their function and surface structure, suggesting Cody dieback has evolved from an introduced plant disease. Alternatively, if the antibodies don't react, it indicates Cody dieback has been here all along. It costs between fifty dollars to $100,000 to produce antibodies. However, manufacturing a lateral flow device costs as little as $0.10. Cents. To put that in context, it would cost only $160,000 to supply every Aucklander one of these tests. In doing so, the phrase community testing takes on a whole other meaning. As Cody Dieback expert and frontline volunteer Dr. Miles Barton told me, this test would be incredibly useful for those of us working in the field. So whether it be volunteers trekking swathes of Cody Forest or people with trees in their town, this test pinpoints the spread from hectares of ridges and ranges to backyards and batches. As soon as dieback pops up, we can dampen it fast and maybe just maybe, corner the disease and eradicate it. However, one final question remains. Lateral flow devices have long been criticised for inaccuracy. What our test gains in rapidity, it loses in reliability. So, is it better to have testing widespread or accurate? As it turns out, we can have both. Because opportunity for innovation is without border or boundary. For example, sampling one metre uphill greatly increases accuracy, while research as far back as the 1980s has found chemicals that attract and isolate phytophthora straight onto the test strip. Electronic test treaters distinguish the most marginal results in recent years, evolving from handheld meters to smartphones. These measures become even more important knowing that if we lost Cody, we would lose our ecosystem. 17 other species rely on these trees, and forests on those 17. Clean Green New Zealand on our forests, and we on Clean Green New Zealand. Think, horticulture, dairy, tourism. These foreign dollar earners all tie back to perceptions. For Northern New Zealand, Cody underpinned the tourist economy. Tanamahutu, New Zealand's largest Cody, receives 200,000 visitors every year. However, the test goes further than just that. Think about the skyrocketing carbon credit industry, where new trees will need to cover 60% of New Zealand's sheep and beef farmland for carbon neutral 2050. Instead of planting pines, there's a push for natives. Cody absorb carbon second only to beech trees over a 30 year period. Over a 60 year period, no other tree comes close. 
and for Tangata Whenua, Iwi, all New Zealanders, this test sheds light on participation, protection, partnership, guiding values from the Treaty of Waitangi. Not only does it protect kauri, forests, and our natural heritage, but community testing presents new chances for participation and partnership. At the same time, this encompasses concepts of kaitiakitanga, caring for our environment, and tonga, safeguarding our natural treasures and icons. Right now, kauri are travelling a path of disappearance, and if we're not careful, they'll continue. But there's a second story here, one of Kiwi invention and innovation. While we've looked for big picture answers, like finding a cure, we missed a small, smart, simple solution. That's always been our motto. I started this project with the intention of creating a quick test for Kodu dieback, but currently, with no proactive approach, it's become a lot more than just that. Sure, you can spray, scrub, wash your shoes, but we've got scores of New Zealanders who would love to get out and save their Kodi. This test, I hope, puts our Kodi in the hands of our communities. After all, these trees are ancestors. Their health reflects not only on our mana today, but for generations to come. Ko te kauri, ko o, ko te o, ko kauri. I am the kauri, the kauri is me.